in case you have not heard enough yet this week, we'll talk a little bit more about biology meets abduction. But before I want to thank DCO, I was involved first time in 2014 during the first summer school in Yellowstone. And I remember at the end of the summer school, Adrian Jones asking for feedback from people. And since I'm a very shy person, I started to give a, eventually what became too much feedback. <laughs> and Adrian told me, OK, well, you run the next one. And a few weeks later, I got a phone call from Carnegie saying, Hi, we heard you volunteer to organize the next Early Career Scientist Workshop. And here I am a few years later, and I'm very grateful for all the stuff I've learned with DCO. Before I start uh, to tell you more about biology meets abduction, I really want to thank all the people involved in this project. Uh, there's 46 different researchers from nine nationalities, all sharing completely all the data made in real time as they come out of every laboratory. This will not be possible without their great contribution. So I'm here today just because they've been so great with us sharing without getting little or no money for all the work they've done. And I want to especially thank what is the core of the biology meets abduction, Karen Lloyd, Peter Berry, Matt Schrenk, and Martin Demur. We spend with them countless hours every week on Skype, sharing screen and discussing data. And I see their faces probably two or three hours a week, which is becoming a little too much. But <laughs> we, I think we're doing exciting stuff. And I want to thank them for all the stuff I learned outside my discipline. We all agree that life, Earth is special. For many people, it's because it harbors life. For me, it's because it's been sustaining life for almost four billion years. That's rather remarkable, because we know Mars was once probably habitable and maybe inhabited. Venus may have been habitable once upon a time. We know that there are thousands of planets out there that may be habitable, and some of them may be inhabited. And yet, as we know right now, Earth has been the only one sustaining life for 4 billion years. We think this is because of the complex set of geobio interaction that have been working over time, geosphere and biosphere interacting, keeping the planet on a trajectory able to sustain life. Things like the redox chemical, geochemical evolution of the surface, and perhaps the subsurface, the evolution of complex biogeochemical cycles over time that is controlling elemental cycling across the planet, or the coupling of processes, biological and geological, that have very different spatial and temporal scales. Now, DCO has been, 10 years of DCO, they've been great in telling us what the role of, the role of subduction, of, sorry, of subsurface microbes in interacting with all this. And we started the biology meets subduction uh, project asking a simple question. Is there a role for biology in subduction processes? In other words, can the subsurface microbe living in this area work as a biofilter and altering the fluxes and the composition of the volatiles coming out. And as Peter Berry already showed you yesterday, we found that, at least in the forearc, a, a complex set of geochemical and biological uh, processes is actually having a quantitative impact that is quite big. Once we figured this out, we started say, asking ourselves, is biology, besides affecting the volatile flux and the composition, also responding to very deep processes that are happening on the subducting slab? The first hint we got about this was still from the paper we published in April, from the analysis of the dissolved carbon pools on the hot spring, where we saw that both dissolved inorganic and organic carbon showed not just trend across the subduction zones, but were also responding cohesively to the two different plates being subducted. They had a different signature between the East Pacific rise and the Cocos plate being subducted. And that was very interesting. So we started thinking that some similar response might be present within the microbial community. However, when we started looking at the microbial diversity across all the sampled sites, things got a bit more complicated. This one is a multidimensional scaling of our bacterial diversity. Points that are close to each other is because they share a community that is similar. And once we started looking for this in our data set, it became apparent that, no surprise, temperature is a big driving feature on, the, on our data set. And this is actually following trends that are across the subduction area. Now, this is not a big surprise. pH and temperature, they matter to life a lot, especially when they correlate 
and they move within such a large scale of pH and temperature, like in our data set. But why to a first order pH and temperature were driving a large portion of the microbial distribution in our data set, things, things were a bit more nuanced. We started, for example, using cations and anions in the fluids to be able to cluster our sites in different groups of place that had simil similar geochemical signature. And once we used these to explain our microbial community, we were able to find very interesting trend. And this time, the trend that you see plotted here, this is still the same multidimensional plot you've seen before. They were not across the arc, but they were following known trend along the arc. So we were rather moving north to south within our data set. That is, microbiology is actually responding in a cohesive way to geochemical trends that are known moving north to south in these subduction zones. We started digging a little deeper to try to understand what geochemical parameter was actually driving this partitioning of the community. And we could not find in such a large data set something that explained the row. And that's not a surprise. When you look such across, as, across a, such a big gradient with a lot of diversity, not everybody cares about the same food source or not everybody has the same preferences. So things have to be taken in a more nuanced way. What we did was take an approach that we call, tell me what you hang out with. So basically the idea is that microbes, they behave in a similar way across our data set. They may either collaborate or share the interest for similar resources. So in order to do this, what we did was to make pairwise correlation of all the species we had. And when we got a strong correlation, we will draw on a network, a connection between the two species. You repeat this with all the species, and some of them, they link to each other, and some of them, they're below the threshold you set. So they fall out of this network. So by doing this, you can build this co-occurrence network of microbes that respond in similar way to parameters in your community. And that's the results we got. Now, this is now colored by the, the phyla of bacteria we have in our data set. Once you have this, you can start to say, OK, forget the diversity for a second. Let's see who's really hanging out with each other. We use the number of mathematical tools that are available for network analysis to figure out groups of microbes that respond in a similar way, what ecologists call cliques. And now you see now groups of species that are colored the same way. They hang out together preferentially more than another place. We use a their abundance, cumulative abundance of the, each cliques, to correlate against the geochemical species. And we found some really interesting things. Now you're seeing the concentration of some geochemical species here. You see the cumulative abundance of this clique. And for example, we identified a couple of cliques that are very abundant in the forearc, and they appear to correlate very well with the carbon sink we described in April. So this microbe might be actually involved in the for our carbon sink we discussed it before. We also find microbes that are responding to copper concentration, and those are main aerobes. Or we found microbes that respond to iron concentration, and that clique is dominated, surprise, surprise, by iron oxidizers. Now, just to show you a little bit more how we were able to track this back to the geology and the geological settings, we identified the presence of the iron oxidizers only in the south, not in the north of Costa Rica. Now, we think this is due actually to the difference between the northern Guanacaste province, which is characterized by very large calderas and a well-developed geothermal system, and the southern, the central portion of Costa Rica, where actually is dominated by stratovolcano, an underdeveloped geothermal system. What we think is happening here is that the sulfide in the system here is precipitating the iron taking it off the microbial plates, while in the south, iron too is still available for microbes to oxidize it. And we found evidence of this both in the geochemistry and the mineralogy. For example, finding pyrite framboid in the north site, and instead, twisted iron hydroxide, the hallmark of iron oxidation, in the central sites only. So supporting this idea that this response is cohesive. Now, when a when I see this data, I cannot help to think about the role of different uh, parameters in subduction, like the deep angle of the slab or the rate delivery, uh, the rate of um, 
convergence in altering the delivery of volatiles and metals. And if you think about this on a more global scale, we know from work from many of the DCO people, Tamsin and Marie and many others, that different geological settings, different subduction zones, they vary in their delivery of metal and volatiles. Now, if you think about this, you think about this in time, I started thinking about, so what's the role of these different flux in influencing microbial diversity? In other words, how has the changing metal availability over time influenced the evolution of biogeochemical cycle, of biological reaction in the biogeochemical cycle? I've been thinking about this a little bit, and I think perhaps we can use trends like this one, uh, copper variation, across the Central America convergent margin that is changing in a predictable way, moving north to south, as a proxy to look across hot springs that have similar pH and temperature gradients, but very different copper content to look for some of these trends. And if you are interested more about this, please come to my poster this afternoon, as I put up a number of ways I thought about thinking about metal delivery and the evolution of biogeochemical cycling. Now, with all this, I want to invite you all to visit me in Naples. I was recently appointed um, assistant professor there. It's a great place. Come visit. I want to thank all my collaborators at Funding Sources. I want to thank DCO and you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donato, for a fantastic talk and a very tempting uh, invitation. I didn't expect to... Uh, Food is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good pizza. Um, I didn't expect to be hearing about high school pub crawls and cliques, so uh, that was a, a nice unexpected twist. Are there any questions? I think they had enough BMS for one week of talks. So I had a question, if it's, uh, if it's okay. Um, have you, 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 you've mainly been thinking about the, the surface environments largely. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there could be a role in terms of the input flux into subduction zones for biology as well? Uh, yes, I think that could be very well the case. I know there's a number of colleagues in the deep life community that have been working in the microbes living in the sediment and the slab, and I've been discussing with some of the people interested in sulfur in subduction zones and what will be the role of microbes working the sulfur cycle in modifying whatever input is going down. And I think there's a lot of open venues. And I was recently speaking with some of the extreme physics and chemistry community about maybe we should start to do some messy high temperature, high pressure experiment, dropping a couple microbes inside the diamond anvil cell just to see, you know, if they survive, that's not my question, but what happens to the partitioning of things when you drop messy organic biology in it. <laughs> so heating and squeezing bugs. Okay, yep. let's leave it on that note. Thank you very much, Donata. Thank you.